focused on prayer in particular, prayer, uh, prayer by the Spirit, prayer in the Spirit. And we looked at Romans 8 as a focus. We cry Abba, Father. And I've been praying that prayer every morning since, well, running up to that class and since, to rejoice that I pray with my brothers and sisters, that I have freedom with God to cry to Him about the deep things that are painful on my heart, that I have an Abba Father, a Daddy Father, and I have a Father who loves me fiercely and disciplines me intentionally for my best interests. What a wonderful thing. And then in the third class from last week, we talked about, actually in the second class, sorry, about prayer, praying. We talked about how the Spirit is on our side from Romans chapter 8, that He prays for us with groans, right, even when we don't know what to pray about. And the Spirit helps move us towards and into the will of God, such that we then live within the will of God. And then, last week, we talked about walking in the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5. And we walk away from what? You remember? What do we walk away from? Sin. Sin, and particularly in that context, the flesh. Our old flesh, our old way of life. We walk away from that, we walk towards what? Jesus, or who, actually, really, right? Walking towards him and his likeness to live like him, and walking with who? Well, with what? The Holy Spirit with one another. Yes, that's right. So we're walking together. We're helping each other on this journey. We're on a, we're on the way from where we are to where we will be forever. But we want to take everybody together, and we need each other. And so the Spirit helps us with that. And I think so. This week's class is an extension of those things as we go into Ephesians here. In uh, chapter 4, as it, perhaps the touchstone verse for today, which says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. If we're going to walk away from the flesh, if we're going to walk towards Christ, and if we're going to do that effectively together, then we're going to need to work at maintaining the unity the Spirit has given us. And we're going to talk about that uh, in our class here today. Now, just before I get into the rest of the material, I did want to say thank you to many of you who prayed for my mum, who has had her hip operation finally after, I think, five postponements. And she is recovering. She's not out of hospital yet, but she is. But it's been a rough week, and I've been, I just wanted to say, I'm so very grateful for the, the, the community sense in which that we pray. We pray together, we pray for one another, both for the, for the congregation here, for me personally, but also with the congregation in Watford. It has strengthened me so much to know that people are praying for me and my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and messages that I've had on Facebook reminding me of that. Joy messaged me even today to ask again after my mother, and that's been wonderful. But, on Monday, three of my family were all in hospital. So my mother was in hospital in Kent. My mother-in-law was in hospital in Bucking Buckinghamshire somewhere, Soakstoke Stoke Mandeville. And my son was in hospital in Watford General. And so I, that, I had three relatives in three different hospitals in three different counties. I, I, was, I was beside myself with, where do I go? Mother-in-law? No, I got this to my mom. No, hang on, my son. I, and and so at times like that, you just, I didn't know what to pray, to some extent. I, and I want them all out of hospital, but there's so much, your, your brain, your spirit maybe, gets so overwhelmed with the stuff, emotionally highly charged stuff, that we really need the spirit. We need a spirit's wisdom, we need his strength, and we need each other. And we need to be able to cry, Abba, Daddy, what's going on? And I've needed, I'm just, I just feel grateful that I've taught this, that it's been in me and that we've been sharing in this together, and that we do, with each other, share these challenging times, but with the spirit and with one another. It's so important. As we look into now tonight into unity, I pray that we will take to heart what we're learning, because it might be the most useful thing you will need tomorrow. It struck me how, how 
serendipitous it is and how lucky I am that God had me study this and teach it just before all of this happened. <coughs> my son, who's out of hospital now, my mother-in-law is still in hospital, but recovering, and my mother is still in hospital, but recovering slowly. But how, how helpful it was that this was relevant to me, more than I realized. I spoke to someone here last Friday who came up to me after the class and said thank you, and then told me about some overwhelmingly challenging things in his life. Then he said, I don't know if I can cope. I think what you're telling me about the Spirit is true, and I think I need the Spirit to help me with this, but I actually don't feel like I can cope with this. My faith isn't strong enough right now for these challenges. I walked away on that Friday night praying for him and thinking about him, and then over the weekend, it happened to me. So, I just want to say that partly out of gratitude for many of you that have been praying for my mother and all that, but partly to say, you don't know how important this class might be. Not my words, but the point of, we might need this right now or tomorrow or the next day really soon. So as we dig into this, I pray that we'll let it sink in for tonight. So first of all, if we're going to talk about unity, we need to think a bit about the bigger picture. So I want to do a big picture overview of unity in the Bible. And I will have to do it fairly rapidly because uh, it's such a big topic and it's a big book. But first of all, let's think about what unity is. Why is it important to God? What does it really mean? So first of all, pre-Jesus. Let's think about the era pre-Jesus, about God and unity. Phase one, you could say is oneness enjoyed. Where was that enjoyed? In Eden. In Eden, there was perfect unity, perfect oneness. God, um, Adam, Eve, everything was great. Um, we know that in uh, Genesis 1.26, God says, let us make man in our image. There's an us thing going on there. So you've got Father, Son, and Spirit. It seems right there in Genesis chapter 1. We've got the... The plurality and the oneness of God. Um, Genesis 1 verse 2 talks about the Spirit hovering over the waters and creators of God was using the Spirit there. That can be interpreted in some slightly different ways, but nonetheless we seem to have a, a oneness and a unity of God, creating something wonderful and beautiful that was completely, utterly harmonious. God, Adam, Eve, humankind and God in perfect unity, perfect oneness, glorious and creative and loving oneness. Fantastic. That's what we have there. Then phase two might be, you could say, after Adam and Eve and the serpent got acquainted and, uh, and some fruit was eaten. So you have that, and that could be maybe oneness destroyed, damage destroyed, uh, at least temporarily for, for the moment. And so we have that, we have that enjoyed, and we have it destroyed, and we see, as we're not going to go into these scriptures in detail right now, but you can look them up, is as well as Genesis 3, we've also got Genesis 11. I preached on this in Lower Earlier a few weeks ago, on the idea that what happens at Babel is not so much that God is cursing humankind and, and all that, but God is being merciful. Because God says, if, if, people, this, uh, if, this, if people are unified in this idolatrous endeavor to build this tower, to build into the heavens, to reach the heavens, right, and it's what's happening in Babel, then nothing will be impossible for them. In other words, not, not nothing good, nothing bad will be impossible for them. Because if... If humankind remains unchecked, we don't tend to do all lots of good stuff. When, when people get a certain mindset, whether you think about uh, the Soviet Union in the, in the 30s and 40s and 50s or something, whether you think about what happened in China under Mao Zedong, whether you think about what happened under Hitler, when you think about Pol Pot, when you, when you have a country or a, a culture that is so unified, it becomes uh, uh, focused uh, in a way that uh, pushes all other options aside, it tends towards malevolence and evil and chaos. And so God in confusing humankind was doing humankind a favor. Because then we couldn't get unified enough as a global entity to be able to do it, to, to be unified in evil intent. And so God protects us from ourselves there because although humankind are developing a unity, they're developing a wrong kind of unity, a human-focused unity rather than a divine-focused unity and oneness. That's the issue there. So we have that phase, and then phase three, is oneness uh, perhaps misemployed? I couldn't think of a better word that rhymed with void at the end. But anyway, maybe misemployed. As in, once you get to Abraham and the covenant's made with him, and that's a wonderful thing, and Abraham's an incredible guy, and he's amazing. But Abraham himself isn't very unified with his wife. I mean, they're not completely one, are they? What with Hagar, and go and sleep with her, and you can have a son by, by him. And also he passes her off as his sister twice, and God tells him off. I mean, I mean, there's a lack. Even God's chosen Abraham isn't one with 
the one person he ought to be most one with, which is his wife. In fact, she's not one with him because it's her idea that go for him to go and sleep with Hagar as well. So you've got a even God's chosen one, still a problem. And then the whole history of Israel. What is the history of Israel? The history of Israel in terms of oneness and unity is brief periods of unity, punctuated by a norm of disharmony. That's the history. So Jacob and Esau, they're not exactly unified. The sons of Jacob, Joseph and his brothers, not exactly unified. The Exodus arguments in the desert, not exactly people are unified with their leaders and with God. The judges, the period of the judges, all the tribal disputes and the cutting up of concubines and wiping out half of the Benjamites. I mean, not exactly unified. The prophets continually calling the people of Israel back to God. And then ultimately the split kingdom between the north and the south. A lack of oneness because of a lack of holding on to a divine oneness as opposed to a human idea of what unity and oneness really is. And so the Old Covenant, the Old Testament as we would see it, consistently demonstrates that what the people have is not, they don't have the spirit of unity. They don't have, it's not there, it's not with them enough. And so God, of course, has always a solution to all of these issues and indeed provides it if we then go to, if you like, the Jesus era. The Jesus era. And briefly to review a couple of key issues to do with Jesus here, which is about love and oneness, is that what did Jesus teach? He said, the way you'll be distinctive in this world is that you will be united, but what's the point of the, the, the unity, or what is the, what is the substance of the unity? It is a love, isn't it? John 13, 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. What kind of love did Jesus have for his disciples? A oneness love, a unity love, a love of all e people equally, fully loved, every single one of them, including Judas. And that bonded them together. And it meant that they stood out. He stood out, they stood out. And that's what he wanted for his, uh, his, for his followers then, and he still wants for us now, is to have an extraordinary level of oneness between us founded upon love. And that oneness is then expressed, for example, in these wonderful uh, points and promises from John 14. <coughs> but Jesus talks about the spirit of truth, and he says, The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. You will have this spirit of love, this spirit of truth, this spirit of unity. You'll have it in you, Jesus says to his disciples. That is what will make all the difference. And then later on in the chapter, verse 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. And you see how we have in that chapter, in you and I live the Spirit, the Father, and Jesus living in us. This is the foundation of our unity, of our oneness in Christ. It's what he has done. And then, just to wrap this point up, John 17, which we won't study now, but the famous chapter about oneness, look how often the word one appears in John 17. I've just cut out some bits from John 17 here. The word unity it's translated unity once at the end of the uh, end of that section, I think, yes. But the rest of the time, what Jesus is praying for is that they may be one. And I really like this. And I think we do better to, most of the time, think about our oneness rather than our unity. I don't mean to say that unity isn't an important word. But there's something about oneness which, to me, is more relational. Am I one with somebody? Not just am I united. United, for me, and maybe it's just me, is a bit more intellectual. Oneness is more on a heart level. Am I united with my wife? Do we believe the same things? But okay, but am I one with my wife? Am I one with my brothers and my sisters? So Jesus uses that word all the way through John 17. May they be one as we are one, and all of them may be one. Uh, I give them the glory that they may be one as we are one. So, so they may be brought to complete unity, but that unity is a oneness. So that's Jesus. And then, again briefly, the early church. 
it was a gr of great concern to the early church that they were united. They put tremendous effort and time into making sure that as the church spread and grew, that the church remained united. Three examples. In Acts chapter 8, the gospel goes to Samaria. You remember Jesus said that the gospel will go to Samaria, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. It goes to Samaria, and the Samaritans become Christians. And so what did Peter and John do? They go to Samaria personally to check it out. Have they understood it? Is the gospel really there? Are they really true Christians? Is it, is it really God moving in Samaria? Because they need to, 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 um, to maintain a unity that the Spirit is giving between Jews and Samaritans, which of course were, who were traditionally enemies. So they, they go there, and then similarly, if, interesting in Acts chapter 11, when Peter baptizes Cornelius, and he goes and tells everybody the good news, what do they say? The people who hear the good news say, what were you doing, Peter? What do you mean you went, you went into the house of a Gentile? What are you doing talking to Gentiles? They, the word is that they criticized him, right? So what do they do? They convene a meeting and they discuss it and figure out that the Spirit is moving. So then they are <coughs> united. So Jews are united with Samaritans and they're now also united with Gentiles. Okay. Time and effort. Perhaps the biggest uh, council of all is Acts 15. Where in Acts 15, so many Gentiles are becoming Christians through the work of Paul and Barnabas that the church in Jerusalem are concerned well, and various people are concerned because you have some people from a Jewish background saying these Gentiles now need to be circumcised to be basically Jewish and Christian. Mm -hmm. And there's a big dispute about that. But what do they do? They don't say, well, that's your opinion, that's your opinion, we'll have to, have to sort of leave it. They say, no, let's travel all the way to Jerusalem. Let's get everybody together and let's bash it out. And they talk and they figure out, ah, oh, the spirits are working. They reflect on scripture. They see the spirit of work, and so the church remains united. And if you've read any of the epistles, any of the letters to the churches, you will note that in almost every letter, there is a significant amount of time developed to the idea of unity. Whether it's Paul writing, or Peter, or James, but being one and being united. And it's also a great concern of the early church fathers. If you read the, the early church fathers from the end of the first century or second century, you will see a, a lot of the emphasis there is on remaining united within churches, but also between churches. So we have an incredible thread through the whole of Scripture, the whole of time, perhaps you could say, the whole of human humankind's existence on this on this planet. It's such a big deal. And so we're going to spend the last bit of our time here just focusing a little bit on Ephesians as an example. And then we need to reflect on what that means for you and I in terms of our unity and our, our oneness. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to read all these scriptures. I'm just putting them there for the sake of emphasis. All the references are on your uh, sheet. I haven't printed all the words because then it would be a five-page uh, handout. But I'll give you the references and you can go in and study these. But I want to show us three things in the book of Ephesians as an example uh, and then see what we think about this. So first of all, all the references to unity and oneness specifically. There you have them on the screen, you have the references on your, on your handout. What does God want? He wants to bring, to, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. Chapter 1 verse 10. He's made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier. Ephesians 2.14 verse 15. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. Talking about Jesus. Chapter 16. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God. Verse 18. So we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Chapter 3. We're members together of one body. Chapter 4. There's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. You get the idea that Paul is, is getting something across here that really matters. In verse four, chapter 4, verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith. This is where we're going with the apostles, prophets, and people equipped to equip people's, uh, God's people for works of service. Until we get to unity in the faith, and so on. In chapter 5, and it comes down to marriage as well. That father and mother will be, he, uh, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So this oneness affects marriage, it affects parenting, it affects church life, it affects maturity in Christ, it affects 
the whole message of the gospel, the oneness that he came to bring between humankind and God. This unity and oneness is a strong emphasis in the, the book of Ephesians. But then, we can look at that and not notice that much about the Spirit. But what about all these scriptures connected to the Spirit in, um, in Ephesians? So here they are. Uh, that's the same thing. So there we go. Okay, no. Skip for one. That one, I think. No, that was a little. That's the one. Is that the one? Anyway, so there's lots of words on there. References to the Spirit in verse 13 of chapter 1. You were marked in him with a seal, the promise, Holy Spirit. Chapter 1, verse 17, the Spirit of wisdom. Chapter 2, verse 18, we have access to the Father by one Spirit. In verse 22, we, are, we become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Our theme verse for the year. Chapter 3, verse 5, um, been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Um, verse 16, that He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. As one body and one spirit. Verse 30, chapter 4. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Chapter 5. Be filled with the Spirit. Chapter 5, verse 19. Sing songs from the Spirit. Chapter 6. Take the sword of the Spirit. And verse 18. Pray in the Spirit. It's clear that true oneness and unity and the Holy Spirit are very strongly connected. And then thirdly. What about all the one another verses? There are so many in the scriptures, but just in it, just in Ephesians, one another scriptures, each other scriptures, and I've also put there scriptures that use the word together, uh, just in the book of uh, of Ephesians. So we have chapter two: the whole building is joined together, talking about us as church, if you like. We're being built together to become a dwelling. Chapter 3, verse 6, six we're heirs together, members together, sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. We're called to bear with one another in love. Verse 32, forgiving each other. Chapter 5, verse 19, speaking to one another. Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, let me pause for a moment. Just thinking about the big picture from Genesis, thinking about then Jesus' emphasis, thinking about the early church's emphasis, and then thinking about what we're just seeing here in, in Ephesians. We're called to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Let me ask you for some thoughts on what you think then it means practically to maintain the unity of the Spirit. What does that mean in, if you like, real life, in Christian life, in church life, in your life, whether it's within your, with your children, with your uh, spouse, with your friends in church, in your particular family group, in your location? What does it really mean then to maintain? What are you seeing from this? What, what's practically more than anything, what are you seeing from what we're looking at here? as to what it means to maintain the unity of the Spirit. What would it look like to do that? What would it look like? How would it be expressed? How could it be done? What stands out? What, perhaps one verse or one command or one example from what we've seen here this evening. What would you say? What stands out? If anything. Chris? Um, I wouldn't think out a verse, but I think it Requires a conscious effort. Conscious effort. Like you were talking about the Antioch and the Peter thing, having to say it's not about a leader who just dishes out instructions, but it's about people actively coming together, and finding common ground, yes. and making a conscious effort yes. to do that. It's conscious, it's deliberate. Mm. Yes. Yes, it is. Mm. All right. Yes. I would say that possibly uh, spending more time together and getting more involved together because if we, we know we have common goals, um, so we should have common problems and common joys as well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, to be together. That's, yeah. Good, thank you. Yes. Be 
Put away falsehood. Speak truth. Speak truth in love. Yeah. But speak truth. Yeah. If we don't speak truth to one another, how can there be any genuine oneness? Okay. So daring to speak the truth. I think when there are differences of opinions, for us to be really good at being slow to speak and good to listen. Slow to speak, quick to listen. To listen. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, having a, developing a good listening attitude. Right. Yeah, communication and dealing with issues stands out as well. Dealing with issues, not letting them, not letting them just slide.
before she moves to get married. And my son is home from hospital, and he's with us for a few days. It is fun having them home, but as some of you older parents know, they've children move back home. It's also a little challenging because I quite like my house the way it is. And, and I like it tidy as it is, and I like to be able to watch my television programs when I want to watch them. And, uh, you know, so I, I dug out, I dug out, one of the things that my children had in their old house was a, an old Nintendo Wii. And so we dug that out, plugged it into my television, and I played Mario Kart with them last night, which I'm rubbish at. And my son, with, with the rubbish controller, came first. And me, with his nunchuck and the other bits and pieces, I came last. And that's not my comfort zone. It's not my, I don't know, it was, it was quite fun, but it's, you know, but you've got to step into other people's world, right? It's the power of the spirit that helps us to do that. And that's the kind of thing, yeah, if you have to play Nintendo Wii, play Nintendo Wii. There might be some slightly more challenging things we might need to do for each other, but it's actions by spirit-filled people that maintain the unity of the spirit. And what is the purpose? The purpose is a verse I think we already looked at, but I think this sums it up. That we love each other with a, with a passion of desire for oneness, such that we will reach you all, all together, with one another, helping one another. We will reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In other words, this unity is not just for the sake of having unity, it's to help each other get to be as mature and full in Christ as we can. That's what it's for. And the world will know that we really are disciples of Jesus Christ and God will be glorified. I hope this whole series has been useful. We haven't answered every question, um, but we have, I hope, answered enough that can help us to learn and grow about the amazing gift of the Spirit, this guarantor of our inheritance, the seal of our, of our uh, salvation, the power we need, the strength we need, the counselor, the advocate, the, the companion we need through the Christian life. And if you have a further questions about the Spirit, do let me know, and maybe we'll teach on it again and answer some of those. Thanks very much. Okay.